start, starting a brand new series called Almost Famous. Uh, I'm pumped about this, and uh, I'm actually recording this message in advance. Um, I had to be in Uganda with our churches there. We're doing our national conference, which is kind of a big deal. And uh, they'd asked if I'd go down, but I was too excited about this series. I said, i, I got to preach it. i, I got to be part of uh, us kicking it off. And so I arranged to record this ahead of time. Uh, thankfully, the Bible says the Word of God is not changed. So it's anointed last week, coming to you this week, and going to touch your heart this morning. Uh, I want you to look at Mark chapter 6. And we're going to read a few verses together and launch into this series that we're going to be doing for the next few weeks. I believe it's going to impact your life. Uh, I believe something incredible is going to happen inside of your heart as God begins to speak to you. So Mark chapter 6, uh, you can pull it up in your Bible. And this is what it says. It's a story of Jesus. It says Jesus left that part of the country. He went away from there and he came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Uh, that was their religious place of worship where they would gather and, uh, as Jews and they worship God and hear the teaching from the, uh, the scriptures. So they went to the synagogue and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? And how are such mighty works done by his hands? Okay. Uh, is this not the carpenter? The son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon are not and are not his sisters here with us. So remember, this is Jesus hometown. These are the people that he grew up with and they know him and they know his family. And he comes back and they go, hey, we know this guy. And they're astonished at his teaching. And the Bible says they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went about among the villages teaching. This is a, a, an incredible story and really a sad story in a lot of ways where Jesus shows up on the scene and something almost happens, but it doesn't quite happen. And today we're kicking off this series, Almost Famous, talking about what it looks like when we get close to encountering God, we get close to fulfilling His purpose, we almost have a touch from Him, almost a breakthrough, but not quite. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that, but as I was thinking about and praying for and preparing this message, I thought, you know, there's really nothing worse than almost. There's nothing worse than eating a meal and being almost satisfied. Right? There's nothing worse than uh, almost studying hard enough to pass your test. Like if you're just, you're barely under the line. I almost passed. It, no one really gives a lot of credit to the almost kind of people. And that feeling of almost is terrible. I, I, I almost, man, I was almost happy. I almost got a promotion. I almost, uh, you know, went on holiday, but I didn't. Not, nothing is quite as bad as almost. Having unfulfilled dreams or desires or intentions inside of our heart. But the reality is a lot of us live in, in a space where that almost stuff is happening to us. And here you've got a picture of Jesus showing up, talking to people, encountering them, and many of them almost having an experience with God and yet missing it. And this is a lesson for us. Most of the time, we're, we're spent in church talking about people that encounter Jesus. We're excited to hear about miracles. We're excited to hear about people whose lives were changed. We're excited to hear about how he went around and he healed the sick and all this stuff. But we're going to begin to look at those that almost encountered Jesus. They got so close to fulfilling their purpose, and yet they actually missed it. And my hope today is that you wouldn't just be near Jesus. That you wouldn't just come into church today and kind of be near him, but that you would experience him for yourself. If you've never experienced God, you can experience him today in a life-giving way in your life. Not just be near and almost meet him, but you can actually meet him for yourself and take the steps necessary to move into your purpose. Now, I hope you're tracking with me this morning. I want to jump into this, and we're going to just begin to really get into the heart of this first message. Uh, and I'm entitling it this, Close to a Miracle. Close to 
a miracle. Look at somebody next to you and tell them you're sitting next to a miracle. <laughs> you're sitting next to a miracle. Here we go. Uh, this is the context we read from Mark. Now, there are four Gospels in the Bible, four accounts of Jesus' life. And out of the four, Mark tends to be one of the most dramatic. Mark uh, likes a lot of action. It's not a lot of speeches, not a lot of filler stuff. He just tells G the story of Jesus one event after the other. And if you read the first five chapters of Mark, it is dramatic. Jesus appears. All of a sudden, John the Baptist is there, and he says, this is the Messiah. And almost immediately, Jesus is confirmed as, as the Messiah. He gets tempted by the devil in the, in the wilderness. The Bible says he overcomes the temptation. He starts calling disciples. He's healed lepers. He's healed the sick in various places. He shows up in synagogues and places of worship. He starts teaching, and they say they're amazed at the authority that he has. I mean, he doesn't have, like, a slow start. Immediately, people start to recognize there's something special going on with Jesus. And this is the picture Mark starts to paint. And he, and he goes from town to town. In fact, the gospel of Mark begins really with Jesus leaving his hometown, Nazareth, and entering into ministry. And he starts to go to Capernaum. He starts to go to different areas. And now, after a little circuit of ministry, and, and all of a sudden, people understand they've seen his teaching. They've witnessed miracles. They've heard stories about this guy, Jesus. And, and, and it's off to this massive start. He's already got disciples gathering around him. There's followers that go with him everywhere. Jesus now comes back to his hometown. He has a homecoming. He comes back to the town of Nazareth. And this is really where we jump into Mark chapter 6. So I want you to understand the context. I don't have time to go through all five chapters of Mark with you this morning, but you can go home and read it and understand that when Mark says Jesus shows up and, and the people are amazed, but they're kind of offended and reject him, what, what Mark is describing is after a really powerful season of ministry, something happens here, and there's people that even in the midst of that miss an encounter with Jesus. And it's almost unthinkable. When you read the gospel and you see, man, he's doing such incredible things. I mean, it's almost like the sky is the limit. There's nothing that, that he couldn't break through. And, and all of a sudden, there's some people that miss out on their moment with God. We don't want to be people like that. And it's, 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 it's really a heartbreaking. They have a miracle worker in their midst. And they're so close to a miracle. And yet they miss the miracle. They miss it. They're so close to it, but they miss it. He, he's been everywhere doing miracles, but when it came time for their miracle, they couldn't experience it. And maybe you're here this morning and you need a miracle. Maybe you're here this morning you need God to speak to you. You might be here this morning you need a miracle in your heart of forgiveness and you need a fresh start. You might be here today and you need a miracle in a relationship or a financial provision. Maybe you need healing in your life. You, you might need a miracle so desperately, but this morning, I don't want you to just get close to a miracle. I want you to receive a miracle. So I want to look at this today and start to break this down and say, how do we, how do we be those people that really get what God intends for us? We're not the ones that almost make it. We're not those ones that almost get close. We're the ones that actually experience it. Close to a miracle. Close to a miracle. Uh, I, I want you to look at this. Mark chapter 6. Just these six verses. And I want to talk to you about uh, three or four things that held them back that day from receiving a miracle. Three or four things that if you're sitting here today actually stopped you and I many times from receiving a miracle from God. And whether you came expecting something or whether you didn't, I'm telling you, these same three or four things that affected them are the same things that affect us today. And I want us to get into this together. So here we go. The first thing is this. The first thing that stops us from receiving a miracle where we can get so close but not actually have it is religious experience. Religious experience. You know, what's funny is this morning you're gathered in a religious kind of venue. You're gathered in a place where there's worship, uh, there's teaching. We're talking about the, the Bible. We're talking about God and, and, and things of a religious nature. And, and really, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. If you're here this morning, you've been a Christian for a while. You've been coming to church for a while. You have a lot of religious experience. You have different services you've been to. 
You can say, man, I remember that camp. I remember this time we did that. I remember this sermon. Oh, I went to a class one time and they taught me this. And we have experiences, right, that are religious in nature. And that's not, that's not bad. That's actually something positive. But do you know sometimes religious experience can stop me from receiving a miracle right now? My past experience. And I want you to think about this. Religious experience, whether it's good or whether it's bad. I imagine there's some people today you have experience with religion that's bad. You go, I, I don't know, one time I tried this thing out. I didn't really like the way people talked to me. I didn't like that church. I didn't like what I heard about Jesus. And maybe you have a bad religious experience. You can stop you from having a miracle. Maybe you're here this morning and you have many uh, good experiences with God. But today there's something fresh God wants to do for you. And the Bible says when Jesus went back to his hometown, he went into the synagogue. He didn't just go anywhere. He went to a religious place. It was a religious place. It was a service like this. You know, the funny thing about services is although God shows up every week, many of the same things happen week in and week out. You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes you look at the worship leader's face and you're like, I already know what songs that guy's going to sing. Uh, you, you, you see the service leader come up and you know the first thing that's going to come out of their mouth because they say the same thing every week. Every week you've got an offering. Every week there's a sermon. Every week, you know, this happens and that happens. And that's not necessarily bad. But do you know having the same religious thing week in and week out can sometimes affect us? And this is really where they're at. They show up in the synagogue. They hear a little message. They pray. They do some stuff. And they go home. But this day, check this out. This day, Something unexpected happened. And it threw them off. This day, it wasn't the ordinary. This day, it wasn't just business as usual. Jesus shows up. The Son of God shows up. And he starts teaching. Not just teaching. He starts teaching with authority. He starts teaching words they're not used to hearing. And in a way, they're not used to hearing it. Miracles start happening. And, and all of a sudden, they go, whoa, this is not what we're used to. This isn't what usually happens to you. Jesus isn't what usually teaching. This isn't really how it's supposed to work. And you see, they thought they knew what to expect from that kind of experience. They thought they had it kind of under control. And what's crazy is they were content with the form of religion. They were content with the outward appearance of getting near God hearing a message from God. But when God showed up in their midst and actually started speaking, they, they, they said, I, I don't, I'm not sure about this. Sometimes it's easier for us to have the appearance of wanting to hear from God than to actually hear from you. Come on. Have you ever been afraid to ask God to speak to you? We're wrapping up our weeks of mission Sundays. It, sometimes it's a scary thing for people. Lord, would you speak to me to go to missions? And, and it's like, I don't know what God's going to say. Is he going to say Africa? You know, is he going to say, you're going to be eating my lions? I mean, like, I, I, I don't know. There's some prayers a little bit scary to have answered. And here Jesus comes, Son of God, shows up. God starts speaking to them. This is what they're after. And they're so close. They're so close, yet they miss it. And can, I, can I challenge you today that if you're sitting here and this is part of your routine, if you're in church today because this is what you do, you always go to church, don't miss a miracle just because of your routine. Can I challenge you, if you have some kind of idea, you might even be visiting, but in your mind you think you know what church is, you think you know what Jesus is, you think you've got God all figured out, don't miss a miracle just because it's not according to your routine. Just because it's a little bit different. Your past religious experience shouldn't be dictating in your life what God wants to do today. Hey, thank God for how he broke through last week. Thank God for what he did in my life last year. Thank God for all the places he's brought me all this time. But today, God wants to do something in my life. Come on, everybody say today. Amen. Right now, God wants to do something in my life. Today, he wants to touch you. Today, he wants to set you free. God is the same, the Bible says, yesterday, today, forever. But he does new things every single day. That's a great place to say amen. amen. He does new things every single day. I don't want my past religious experience to dictate what God can or cannot do in my life right now in this moment. 2 Timothy 3.5 says, there's people that have a form of godliness, but deny its power. That I can look good on the outside, 
religious on the outside, but when it really comes time for God to change my life, to do a miracle for me, somehow I, I, I go, well, I, I'm not sure. I, it, the air cone was too hot today. It was too cold. I didn't like it. They moved my chair. It wasn't what I was used to. Well, I don't know. The music was a little loud. I couldn't really hear God. No, I, the, my religious experience is not going to dictate what God wants to do. And it can actually stop me from experiencing a miracle. The second thing that you can see in their life that stops them from having a miracle is familiarity. Familiarity. The Bible says Jesus left where he was and he goes with his disciples back to his hometown, a place that was familiar, right? A place that was familiar. Everyone has a place that's familiar to you. Some of you, the chair you're sitting on is familiar to you. It's kind of shaped like part of you, if you understand what I'm saying. It's familiar. <laughs> You know who your neighbors are going to be. It's always the same people every week. And, and, and we like the familiar. We like, my, when, when my, me and my kids go to McDonald's, they order the same thing every single time. Every time. I don't even have to ask them anymore. I know what the orders are. I know what everybody wants. It's familiar. It's safe. It, it's great. When I go out to eat, I eat familiar things. There's nothing worse to me than being disappointed when you're hungry. So I would rather eat something familiar that I know is going to taste a certain way than take a risk and be disappointed and I'm upset for the rest of my day. So some of you are a little more adventurous, but I'm just not that way. We like the familiar. Now, Jesus goes back to his hometown. Check this out. Nazareth is not just any town. Uh, a lot of scholars believe that Nazareth, it, as they excavate and look at the surrounding area, it's a very, very, very small town. I think town is probably a stretch. You're more talking about like a housing estate. Uh, some people would believe it was probably a, like a population of about 500 or so people. So when they say they know Jesus, when they say we think we know this guy, we know his brothers and sisters. Did you know Jesus had brothers and sisters? It's true. And he had brothers and sisters and, and his parents. And they go, we, we know who this guy is. They actually really knew him. He grew up right around there. They saw him. And when Jesus shows back up, they go, I know this person. This is hard for us sometimes. It's hard for us to receive. Do you know that God may want to give a miracle to you and do a miracle in your life, but he may want to do it through someone that is familiar to you. He may want to speak a word to you through someone that you go, I, I know this person. I, I've known them for so long. How, how come they're coming to encourage me? Why is it them you know, wanting to pray for me and this kind of thing? But, but God's not constrained by your familiarity. The familiar can put us off sometimes. And this is where they're at. God has, God has something for each and every one of us. Can I say this? This morning, God has a, something he wants to do for you. He has a work he wants to do inside your life. But, but listen to this. He's going to do it through a human package. God's going to do something in your life, but he's going to do it through another person. He's going to encourage you through another person. He's going to speak to you through another person around you. Uh, all the things that God wants to accomplish in our hearts. Think about it. Discipleship. Ministry that happens in your life. Connection. Some of you are lonely. You need friends. And God's, God's not just going to show up and send angels to surround you. He's going to have people surround you. And, and, and many times we can be familiar with the package that comes. And we miss the miracle that God wants to give. And what's catching me about the story is when you hear these guys encounter Jesus, they don't say he's not a miracle worker. Watch this. Read the Bible. They don't say he can't do miracles. They don't say that. They don't say, oh, we don't like his teaching. They don't say that. They go, these words, how could it come from that guy? Well, these miracles, this authority. In fact, the Bible literally says he healed sick people. They saw miracles, but they go, we just can't accept it from this God. And sometimes we have trouble re receiving from the familiar. Maybe you're not ready to receive a miracle this morning because it's just so familiar. Showing up in that same building, talking to the same person, saying the same thing every week. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. God bless you. Hallelujah. Woo! And then we all go home. And a lot of times we prefer the spooky stuff to the familiar. But right now in a familiar place, I think God can do a miracle inside you. We like spooky stuff. We don't think the miracle is going to come just on an ordinary Sunday morning. 
You don't think a miracle is going to come on Monday when you show up at work. But in the familiar place, God can do a miracle inside your life. And the reason they missed it is because they go, we know this guy. We know this place. We know what this is like. And this doesn't usually happen. We know this. It's familiar. 2 Kings 5.11, there's this funny scripture. It says, Naaman became angry and he stopped away. This was a guy God wanted to do a miracle. And he goes to the prophet. He's got leprosy, incurable disease. He goes to the prophet. He says, hey, heal me. And the prophet doesn't even come out of his front door to meet Naaman. He just says, go dip seven times in the river and you'll be healed. And the Bible says Naaman became angry and he, he didn't just walk away. He stalked away. This is the first uh, historical account of a stalker. Uh, he stalked away. And he goes, he says this, listen, I thought he would come out to meet me. And I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord as God and heal me. But you know what's funny is Naaman expected something spooky. Naaman expected something like extravagant. I thought the heaven would open up and lightning bolts would shoot down. But God used something familiar. He goes, hey, just dip in that river. Just go do this simple thing. Do you know God can actually do a miracle in your life through a familiar thing? Today in this service, the same person might pray for you that's prayed for you a thousand times. But can I tell you, it could be a miracle moment inside your life. You could come to the same altar. You could respond to the same word. You could have the same faith in your heart. But God can use it to do a miracle. Don't miss it just because it's familiar. Just because you've seen it before doesn't mean that it can't touch you today. This same old service could touch and change your life today familiar. They got close to a miracle. But because they had this religious experience and they thought they figured out because Jesus was so familiar to them. He grew up there. They said we know him. They, they couldn't accept it. They got close to a miracle. But they didn't receive it. They didn't receive it. The third thing that can stop you from receiving a miracle is unbelief. 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 Now, this is a unique word, and I want you to understand what it means. When we say unbelief, we're not talking about doubt. Doubt is different than unbelief. Doubt is a question. Doubt is a wavering. Like, I, I think, I, I, I think this is going to be good, and then something in the back of your mind is like, mm, I'm not sure. I, I think the weather's going to be a good day, but I, it might rain. I think God's going to come through, but... I don't know. There's just that little wavering, that little questioning, that's doubt. Unbelief is something different. Unbelief in the scripture is, is something that is opposed to what God is saying or doing. It's actually a choice and a mentality and a spirit that resists what God is saying, what he's doing, or what he intends to do. That's unbelief. And what you find in Nazareth is not people that go, uh, I'm not sure if I can believe that he could do a miracle today. That's not what it says. Actually, the, the Bible says clearly, they state this. They scoffed at him. They mocked him. He's just a carpenter. He's the son of Mary, the brother of James Joseph. And, and he goes, we know his sisters. And because of his unbelief, he couldn't do miracles, but he laid hands on a few sick people and he healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. What amazed Jesus was actually the unbelief of the, he was so shocked that I could be right in front of you. I could be doing miracles. I could be healing the sick. I could be doing all this stuff. And yet you still refuse to believe this amazed Jesus. It amazed him. So not, it's not just a doubt, but a refusal to believe. And the Bible literally says they became offended at Jesus. This word offended is a Greek word that we get our English word scandal. They were scandalized by Jesus. In fact, all through the scripture, when that word is used, it's usually used about the cross. Because people were offended at the cross. Or how could Jesus the Messiah be, be killed on the cross? If he's the son of God, why doesn't he come down? And he uses the same word Mark does about how they were offended at Jesus. They go, we, we can't accept it. We refuse to believe it. And what, I want you to think about the picture. The gospel is presented to them. Jesus is right there in front of them, but they don't have faith. This morning, the best could be presented to you, but if you don't have faith, you can actually end up offended. You know the gospel offends people? 
It offends people when they don't have faith. The truth of the Bible offends people when they don't have faith. You can hear the same truth, and if you have faith, it'll encourage you, and someone else, it'll frustrate them. It'll frustrate you. God wants to do a miracle for you, and if you have faith, you go, yes, I, that's so exciting. And, and yet, if you have unbelief, you'll say, I, I don't think that, I don't see any miracles in my life, and you'll be offended by the same word. Jesus shows up, and this is what he finds in their heart. In other words, they rejected what Jesus could do. Now picture this. They didn't just reject what he could do. They rejected what Jesus could do while he was doing it. It's crazy. He's laying hands on sick people, and while he's healing them, they go, we don't believe in this guy. He's standing in front of them, teaching the word of God. And while he's teaching, they refuse to believe. And they say, we don't accept the authority of his words. And their own mouths condemn them. With their own mouth, they say, isn't this Mary's son? Isn't this Jesus? How does he have this kind of teaching? They recognize that what's coming out of him is special. He didn't go to school for this. He's not trained. How does he have it? And yet they're offended because of the unbelief of their hearts. See, unbelief can twist your perspective. Unbelief will get you bitter and frustrated. Unbelief will get you right next to a miracle and you still won't enter in because you refuse to believe it's for you. Unbelief, I refuse to believe God wants to work in my life. I refuse to believe God's calling me. I refuse to believe he's speaking to my heart and I can get so close to a miracle and still miss it. And the Bible says he was amazed. At their unbelief. Amazed. And if you read the Gospel of Mark, you'll find that up to this point, the first five chapters, Mark keeps using this word saying the crowds were amazed at Jesus' teaching. The crowds were amazed at the authority. They were amazed at Jesus. And now this is the first time that, that he, and the only time that Mark uses it with Jesus saying, you know what? They were always amazed at Jesus, but in his hometown, Jesus was amazed at the level of their unbelief that they could be that close to a miracle and yet miss it at the same time. They were watching miracles and they were missing their own miracle. Don't, don't do this to me. Listen, listen to me. Across every location, don't get close to a miracle and miss it. Do you know that you're sitting in a room full of miracles this morning? You're sitting in a room full of miracles. Look at someone next to you and tell them, you look miraculous. Come on, this is your moment. If you're single, sit next to someone cute, tell them, you look miraculous today. Hey, this is the truth. You're sitting next to a miracle. This, the, every single congregation, every single room is filled with people that have had a touch from God in our lives. Come on, if you believe it, you need to get in agreement and say amen. God touched you. He healed you. He saved you. Come on, if God has ever done a miracle for you, lift up your hand and wave it right now. Come on, let us see it this morning. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Come on, give Jesus a clap if you believe it. He's done a miracle for you. And when you sit in a place like this, you're not just coming to a nice auditorium. You're not just coming to a nice service. You're sitting next to miracles. So don't come in here and let the enemy sow unbelief inside your heart and say, I don't think God can do it for me. Don't let the enemy put doubt inside your life to say, I don't think this is a breakthrough. I don't think it's for me. I don't think that's, no, no, no. You're sitting in a room full of examples of how God can yes, break through in so people's good. lives. Yes. And this morning he can break through in yes. your life in the same way. Yeah. You might be here visiting. Maybe this is your first time, you're a guest with us, or, or you've come before, but you've never invited Jesus inside your heart. Can I tell you, you can have the same miracle that I've had, and that everyone seated across these auditoriums has had, that Jesus could become your Savior today, your sins could be forgiven, your past wiped away, yes. and you could know God for yourself. You could experience uh, miracles. You could be forgiven. Come on, you could be healed. Yes. Come on, you can overcome. Don't let unbelief bring you close and rob you of a miracle. So four things. Number one, religious experience gets you close to a miracle. Almost to a miracle, but not quite. Familiarity can bring you so close and yet miss the miracle. Unbelief can bring you close, yet you miss the miracle. And here's the last one is I invite musicians to come up in every location. They covered up their needs. They covered up their needs. As I read this, I, I couldn't 
I couldn't believe it as I thought about the town and thought about the venue and Jesus beginning to minister to these guys. And the, the Bible says this really sad thing. It says, because of their unbelief, Jesus couldn't do any miracles among them except place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Or some translations say he could do no mighty work there. In other words, it wasn't that Jesus couldn't heal people, but they were so unbelieving. They were rejecting his ministry, so there was no big breakthrough that day in their town. There were healings. There were miracles. But the town didn't have a breakthrough because they rejected him. And I thought, isn't that incredible that some people came to Jesus and they said, we're sick, we need you to heal us. But many people were near Jesus and said, we don't care what our need is, we reject you, we don't need what you have. You know what could bring you so close to a miracle this morning and yet you miss it? Is when you cover up your need. When you, when you just act like, I don't need anything. I've got it all together. I, I, I don't really need this today. Well, I know there's some problems in my life, but I'd rather just have a nice service than really have an encounter with God. And you begin to cover up the need inside of your life. There had to be more sick. There had to be, there were people in that synagogue that needed his teaching. There were people that needed a savior, but they pretended like they didn't need this. We reject it. It's fine. Oh, just let it come and go. It will just go back to life as usual. And they got close to a miracle and they missed it. Right now, today, sitting in this place, you are so close to a miracle because Jesus is in this place. You're so close to a miracle because Jesus is here to touch you. Jesus is here to heal you. Jesus wants to do something inside your life. But the key is you don't cover up your need. You bring your need to Jesus. I don't have to pretend like everything's okay. I don't need it. No, I can openly say, God, I need you to come through in my life. Do you need healing? Do you need comfort? Do you need the presence of God to come in? Come on, some of you, it's been a long time since you experienced the reality of God in your life. Is there a need? Would you stop covering it up and just say, Lord, I need you today. Because even in Nazareth, even in his hometown, even in a hostile environment, even when everything was pushing against Jesus, the ones that came to him and said, I have a need, are the ones that got a miracle. The ones that opened up their heart and said, I've got something that only you can do, Jesus. They're the ones that received a breakthrough and a miracle from God. And this morning, I believe that God wants to do a miracle in your life. Don't choose your need over a miracle. Don't choose your lifestyle over a miracle. Don't, don't choose your comfort over a miracle. Today as we end, we're going to pray. And if you need a miracle, the miracle worker is here. Jesus is here and he can touch and heal. And so today what we're going to do is this. In a moment, I'm going to open up the altars for us to pray. And I'm going to invite us to begin to respond to the word of God. And but before the end of the service, if you're here and you've never invited Jesus in your heart, the service leader is going to come and give you an opportunity to pray and experience a miracle of salvation.